ever wonder if a book's worth reading, if it's worth the money even buying it, or if it's even worth all that hype? What about a TV show or a movie? You just can't trust the internet these days. I'm Katie, and I'm not afraid to spoil the books and the movies for you. Welcome to Spoiler Alert, and I'll spoil anything. Welcome to Spoiler Alert, episode two, and I'm gonna talk about the Afterlife Investigation series, book two, The Forest. In 1989, Ian Lancaster, possessed by an entity only known as the Occupant, escaped a high-security room in Chaith Asylum. She killed three patients and two staff members in her attempt to escape Chaith Asylum and was killed only moments before escaping. 28 years later, we're with Professor Barlow, Elizabeth Morrissey, and her boyfriend, Jake. They accidentally let the Occupant out. Now what? Stick around in the next part to know what happens. So if you remember, we were talking about um, Stephen Barlow. He decides that he does not have enough information on the occupant, and he is positive that they are not done with it. Elizabeth and Jake want nothing to do with it, though. Can, I bl can you blame them, though? So Stephen Barlow does some research. Come to find out that W.R. Corvain pretty much lost his mind when his wife and daughter died in a fire. This triggered all of this research on the afterlife and how to contact entities. So he decides to dig even deeper. While he was in the asylum, he had discovered some coordinates in uh, Corvine's old stuff in that sensory deprivation chamber. For some reason, he thinks it's a good idea to go to said um, coordinates. Turns out Corvine has a cabin there. You can guess that there's a whole bunch of information that Barlow was just not ready for. So, of course, um, Elizabeth and Jake want nothing to do with this little road trip of Barlow's all the way out to the middle of freaking nowhere. The coordinates lead to a cabin in the middle of the Hiawatha National Forest in Michigan. The entire way there, everything seems fine until Barlow gets to the forest. He has no idea where he's going, and he feels like something's watching him. Once Barlow gets to the coordinates, it's just this run-down abandoned cabin. But it's full of Corvine's research and notes. Turns out, Corvine's original experiments, he had been running them on his own niece, Janie. When Corvine initially made contact with the occupant, he had hoped that the occupant would help him resurrect his wife and daughter, but of course the occupant was taking advantage of him. Basically, the occupant told Corvine that if he gave the, the occupant a suitable host, that it would resurrect his niece or his daughter and his wife. I mean, as readers, we all know that's not going to happen, but Corvine was desperate. Corvine learns that Janie is not considered a suitable host for several reasons. The main one being that she's not fertile. Apparently what the host needs is for the person that it is currently possessing to give birth to it. So obviously Janie is of no use to Corvine, so he sticks her in an insane asylum. The entire time Barlow is reading these notes and listening to these audio recordings, he feels like something's watching him. When he gets back out to his car, he sees the occupant standing on the roof of the cabin. Obviously shaken, Professor Barlow decides to hunker down in his car for the rest of the night. When he wakes up, he comes to the sensible conclusion that he should probably take off, but he's going to take everything he found with him. As he's loading all of Corvine's stuff up into his car, someone fires a shotgun into the air and then tells him to get on the ground. Turns out that this person holding Barlow up is actually Janie, Corvine's niece. She tells him that she actually killed Corvine. Essentially, what happened was, after the whole Third Ward incident with Enid Lancaster, Corvine decided, hey, I screwed up. I should probably figure out a way to send this thing back where it came from. So he comes back and gets Janie and tries to force her to start taking the drugs and undergo the experiments again. Obviously, Janie said no, killed him, and then buried him in the woods. Janie let Barlow know that he's always been... So here's the rub on the occupant. 
Since Janie had been possessed by the occupant originally in the original experiments before the third ward incident, she got um, a, like a kind of a, a behind the scenes on what the occupant. This gets a little confusing, so stay with me. Essentially, the occupant never has been nor ever will be a person. It's this other thing. It lives in the world of the dead and it can see through the eyes of the dying. Remember that student that died in Barlow's arm? Well, um, he's how the occupant became aware of Barlow to begin with. From that moment, the occupant decided that Barlow was gonna be his next plaything. Janie warns Barlow that he needs to go back and keep an eye on Elizabeth because she is prime occupant material. She also warns that if she sees him again, she will kill him. Barlow packs up all of Corvine's stuff into his car and heads back to Ohio. As he's driving, he sees he has a whole bunch of voicemails and messages from uh, Elizabeth saying, hey, what's up? Are you safe? How did everything go? But she is not answering his phone calls or texts. At first it's fine, but six hours later, he's starting to worry. Elizabeth never shuts up. With the feeling that something is still watching him and the assurance that from Janie that the occupant is watching him, um, he decides that he needs to rush back to Ohio. Pedal to the metal, he goes straight to the dorm rooms at the college. He finds Jake there, standing in the rain with a black eye. Essentially, the occupant possessed Elizabeth and it beat the crap out of Jake and took off. Poor Jake had been wandering around all day trying to find his possessed girlfriend with no luck. So he and Barlow spend a few hours driving around town. No luck. After a couple of hours, they decide it's time. Since Elizabeth is technically an adult, there's nothing they can really do in terms of calling the police. So there's only one other thing they can do. Go to her parents. Elizabeth's parents aren't too fond of Jake, but when he tells them that Elizabeth has run off again, they let them in the house. Turns out, in addition to being a compulsive liar, Elizabeth is adopted. When hi in high school, Elizabeth decided she wanted to contact her birth parents, and she would frequently run away and try to find them. Here's the weird part. Elizabeth's parents decided that they were going to contact uh, the adoption agency and try and find out as much information on her birth parents as they could, so that way she'd stop running away. The last name of Elizabeth's birth mom, Lancaster. You heard me right, Lancaster, just like Edith. You know, the lady from the third ward incident at Chait Asylum. Barlow is immediately all over that. He's like, what? <laughs> also, turns out that Elizabeth is from this town called Millsbourne, but no one can find anything on it. While they're talking to Elizabeth's parents, Elizabeth's mom gets a phone call from Elizabeth. Or so the mom thinks. The occupant in Elizabeth's body tells her that she decided that she wasn't going to go looking for her birth parents after all. And that she really didn't want to talk to anyone. Then she asks to talk to Jake. Here's where it gets a little weird. In one of the tapes with Corvine, he is going to test the occupant and he's thinking about writing. Continuing. So in one of the tapes that Corvine uh, was doing with Janie, when he first met the occupant, he decided, oh, I'm going to test the occupant to see if it really is spiritual or whatever. He thinks in his mind, I am going to write down what big eyes you have on the paper. Before he can say or write anything, Janie or the occupant says, the better to see you with. Back to Jake and Barlow. When Jake takes the phone from Elizabeth's mother, the occupant tells Jake, the better to see you with. Obviously shaken, Jake doesn't know what to say, so he just tells Elizabeth's parents that Elizabeth broke up with him and that they're gonna see other people. Another bit of backstory. When Elizabeth was adopted by her parents, new parents, she had been badly beaten almost to the point of death. This is important because I forgot to uh, mention. 
Janie says that in order to make contact with the occupant, you have to be touched by death. So like when that student died in Barlow's arms or the fact that Jamie was an orphan or when Elizabeth was almost beat to death. So they leave and they head back to the university to study on this Millsborn. They can't find anything in the entire library or on the internet. So they reach out to another professor who refers them to another professor who is a history major. Turns out that Millsborn used to be a mining town in the middle of the Hiawatha National Forest in Michigan. The last person who sought it out came back and had completely lost his mind. When he disappeared to Millsborn again, he never came back. The professor gives them one other piece of information. Coordinates. So, because Barlow is a raging genius, he decides that he's going to drag poor Jake to Millsborn because he thinks, hmm, maybe that's where the occupant's going. As they drive, they both have the sensation that they're being watched. At one point, they drive up on Elizabeth, walking backwards, missing one shoe, soaking wet in the rain. She climbs up to the car and they're surrounded by whispers. Won't you let me in? Won't you let me in? Barlow floors it. Which is like the first smart thing he does? I don't know. Two seconds later, Elizabeth is in front of the car again and decides to climb up on the hood of the car. Barlow floors it again. For the rest of the drive, they, as they drive, they see the occupant everywhere. It purposely shows itself in the shadows, standing on top of a bridge, standing on top of a building, trying to scare the crap out of them, basically. Eventually, Jake falls asleep, but Barlow decides, hey, I'm tired too. So he pulls over and decides to get some rest. Which is fine until Jake wakes him up and they, he says, I can hear Elizabeth. They hear Elizabeth calling out to them from the forest. And like smart people, they decide to follow Elizabeth. Okay, to give Barlow credit, he says, hey, maybe we shouldn't be following the voice of the person who's uh, possessed by the occupant. But Jake goes anyways. When they make it back to the car, it's been set on fire along with all of Corvine's research. That's it. That's the end of the book. If you enjoyed this episode of Spoiler Alert, please be sure to like and then subscribe as well.